Um, this is the official start of the second panel uh, on embodied AI, virtual humans and social robots. Today we have a focus on the situation in the Netherlands and I think I will just get started by sharing my slides. See if I still know how this works after all these months. Nope, then I need to switch them around. Um, where was that again? I can't find where to switch. Oh, here, swap. Now you're seeing the correct ones. I want to see you again. So yes, we have a rough program for today. We will first start with an introduction round of all the panelists and the organizers. Then the main part of the event will start, which will be the actual discussion. We are aiming to wrap up the official part of this event around 4 p.m. And then the last half an hour, uh, we will stop the recording and we can have like a more of an informal discussion amongst all of us. So I guess I will now give the floor to Tibor Bosse, one of our panelists. Yes, thank you very much, Maartje. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. So, um, yes, great to, to be here. Thanks a lot for the uh, invitation. So I was asked to give a very brief introduction to myself. Uh, so I decided to do that by referring to a timeline of my career in academia, which you can see on this slide. So currently I'm a professor of AI and communication science at uh, Radboud University in Nijmegen. Um, I'm the head of the communication and media group, which is part of the Behavioral Science Institute. Um, but yes, if we go a little bit back in time, and you could already see some animations there, um, I started uh, at a completely different um, faculty, completely different university. Um, and usually when I introduce myself and my career, I make the joke that as a little boy, I was only interested in computers. And then over time, I became more and more interested in people. And I think you will see this if you look at this timeline. So 1996, I started my, uh, well, it was called uh, doctoral at the time. Um, so master's in computer science uh, at the VU in Amsterdam. Um, and as you can see here in the, the different uh, boxes there, um, my focus shifted more and more from purely technical research to um, interdisciplinary research on the boundary of computer science and uh, psychology mainly. Um, so after my uh, master's period, I uh, was lucky to be able to do a PhD uh, also at the VU, so between 2002 and 2006 in the agent systems group, and that was already a little bit interdisciplinary. Um, perhaps you can just go back one slide, uh, Marci, if that's still possible yes to keep it here um so that was the agent systems group so at the time i was interested in building uh, ai systems mainly from the technical perspective but as you can also see uh, in later years i uh, the name of the group was changed to behavior informatics group so that already gives away that we were also interested more and more in human behavior um so over the years, basically what happened is that when I was interested in building these systems, uh, social embodied AI systems, as we're going to talk about today, uh, I realized that I was not only interested in, in really creating them, but at some point you cannot avoid the question, well, what does this do to people? If we build robots, if we build chatbots, how do people perceive that? When do they think it's interesting to engage in conversations with them? Um, and those kinds of types of questions, I address them more and more. Um, and currently I'm in an environment um, in the communication science group where we really focus on these questions. This is okay, yeah, we, you can keep it on this slide. Um, so, yes, if I would have to summarize the core um, theme of my research, I would call it social AI. And for me, that is really a spectrum of different applications, different systems, as you can see in the three pictures above. 
Um, so on the left hand side of the spectrum, I'm interested in uh, chatbots, so purely text based computer systems and on the right hand side also in physical social robots. Um, and then there's a lot of things in between. So overall, I would say I'm interested in uh, the social interaction between people and any kind of technology that somehow pretends to be human to a certain extent. Um, and then varying from very uh, text based system to really embodied systems, you can uh, ask different questions. So what you see in between, of course, is an intelligent virtual agent in an artificial environment like a computer game. Oh, this goes a little bit quick. Um, but yes, for me, this is really a spectrum of different uh, application domains. Um, and then the, the triangle on the bottom is kind of an overview of the different questions in our group we are asking. And as you can see, that varies from really technical algorithmic questions. So how can we endow these social agents with human-like behavior, for instance, by exploiting novel natural language processing technologies, by making them able to respond to emotions that they detect, um, but at the same time, we also address the social perspective. So assuming that these systems, uh, they, they somehow show believable behavior, how can we measure whether people really believe that? And I think the, the concept of anthropomorphism plays an important role here. So we all have this tendency to project human-like mental states on robots as soon as they behave a little bit human-like, but when exactly do we do that and when not? And then the third perspective is an applied perspective. So we're also interested in uh, applying these social agents, for instance, in behavioral change applications or in training of social skills in a number of different domains. Um, so I'll leave it at that because uh, we have many people to introduce for now, but I'm sure we'll get back to these questions later. Thank you. Yes, I think we already saw that our next Introduction will be from Keat Trong. Yes, hi, my name is uh, Keat Trong. I hope you can all hear me. Um, I'm an assistant professor at uh, Human Media Interaction, uh, University of Twente. Um, well, how did I uh, end up there? Um, I have always been interested in uh, speech and language and interested in uh, how to uh, transfer that kind of knowledge into uh, systems, into machines like uh, agents or robots. Um, so that's why I did a uh, master in computational linguistics in Utrecht. Uh, and then I went on to uh, TNO in Soesterberg, where uh, I met Mark Nerings. Uh, and uh, I worked on my PhD on emotion recognition in speech. Um, so I have been at HMI since 2009 and started there as a postdoc. Um, in the meantime, I also had a uh, part-time uh, lecturer position um, at Radboud University, where I met Pim, uh, Pim Hazelager, who is also here. Um, I was teaching HRI there, um, but now I'm just fully uh, uh, at HMI. Um, yeah, my keywords, um, you see my keywords there. So it's uh, really about spoken conversational interaction and uh, non-verbal aspects in speech. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. So what I would like to do in my research or my ultimate goal is um, to go beyond words. So there's really more than just words. And uh, the idea is, you know, now nowadays we have speech recognition, automatic speech recognition that gives you uh, the text, gives you a string of words. But there's really more than, than that. Eh? There's really more than words. And that's the kind of things that I'm interested in, the paralinguistics behind or on top of the linguistics. Um, so, um, you know, my colleagues in automatic speech recognition, uh, they've uh, done a great deal of work, um, but I would like to uh, take it a step further and make it a little bit more, uh, let's say, intelligent. Um, so in practice, what I do is I, I study human-human communication uh, and uh, human-machine communication. Um, so how can we model human-human communication computationally and how can we use that knowledge to inform um, 
the development of conversational agents and uh, robots, for example. Next slide, please. Um, so here are just some research examples that uh, I've been uh, working on together with uh, collaborators. Um, so I've been uh, working on laughter, uh, automatic laughter detection, and also uh, looking into the role of laughter in uh, uh, conversation. Um, we've been looking at how to develop an artificial listener. So for example, um, when should an, an agent make a nod or a back channel like mm -hmm. um, more recently um, I've become more interest interested in um, personalized um, speech technology so there are some uh, minority groups uh, that do not have access to speech technology for example um, for those groups you really have to uh, uh, go for a personalized approach and a lot of the times we think in research that's not really you know interesting or it's not um, um, efficient enough uh, but I think that this is uh, yeah, for them it's really uh, really helpful if we can can, up, can come up with something that helps them and um, we've been looking at ways to make it personalized while also being um, useful for uh, the larger than the individual. Um, speech as a biomarker uh, for uh, analysis of psychiatric disorders such as uh, depression. Um, this is something I've also been recently interested in. Um, and another type of research or application area is uh, enhancing multimedia retrieval. So going beyond uh, just looking for topics uh, in uh, multimedia but uh, imagine that you can also look for emotions or for um, uh, things like conflicts. Um, so those are basically the application areas uh, that I'm working in. Um, conversational agents, health and uh, multimedia retrieval. Next slide. Do I have a next slide? No. no. OK, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Keith. Uh, next up is Mark Neerings. Yes, uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, and uh, I would start to refer to Tibor's remark. So uh, at first I was only interested in uh, human beings and later I got some interest in computers and artificial intelligence. So I started with a study in psychology. Um, maybe next slide, uh, Mark. Uh, so currently I have two positions. So I'm principal scientist at TNO working in a group that's called human robot agent teaming with all kinds of buzzwords that shows also my interest a mutual understanding mutual trust complementary knowledge and skills so that fits also very well and so what's now in uh, the new zwaartekracht uh, gravitation program on hybrid intelligence so it's really on augmenting human intelligence that's a major interest and it, also relates to the work that I do at the Delft University of Technology in the Interactive Intelligence Group of Kathleen Juncker. So when you see there, the word is combining intelligent agent technology, cognitive engineering, psychology, affective computing, value sensitive design and human computer interaction. So that are really the kind of terms, the buzzwords the, of my research. And in general also, so uh, I, I work a lot uh, on trying to get the persons collaborating. So, so we really need uh, the kind of research uh, that uh, has experience from the social sciences, from computer science, from uh, artificial intelligence, also from the domain. So in th that type of projects, you really develop new knowledge. And um, th th that's also where I like to aim at. Maybe the next slide. Well, this is an example of a project, yeah, so, so really a, a multidisciplinary project, a European project, the PAL project, just to show you briefly uh, the kind of new uh, social agents or social robots that I'm working on, with others of course. Um, so here it's a robot for children with diabetes, to teach them to learn them to cope with diabetes. And so and with the robot, so they can share objectives, 
They can also make specific kind of agreements about the kind of educative goals that they would like to establish the coming week. They can share experiences on the diabetes management together with them. And so they build also some relationship with the robot and the robot can provide some feedback and explanation. So in that case, so really the robot is what I call a partner in diabetes management, not only for the child, but also for the caregivers. And maybe you can show the next slide, Maartje. And I also do it in a completely different domain. So this is uh, search and rescue, uh, also from a European project, a trader project. Uh, so, so there uh, it's disaster management and uh, you would like to rescue victims. And there you have also already robots available for the team, the fire bracket officer teams and the first responders. So there they share objectives, for example, about saving victims, but also uh, um, uh, attacking the fire. They can also make agreements there, uh, so about uh, task allocation, agreements also with the robots. So where they should go into a specific area, they can share experiences. And also there we would like also that the robots can provide feedback and explanations. So a similar type of models, but, but they are instantiated in a completely different domain. But that's the way also that you develop really new theories and models uh, that generalize over these domains. The next sheet, please. So an important topic is so, so how to develop so the kind of theories and models you need to develop these type of systems. So and there are some important starting points that we take. So, and one is says that humans and robots are really distinct and they form a really a new type of team and we call it the hybrid teams, warranting really new theorizing and modeling. And that's really relevant because also particularly that the, all the kind of different robot roles have and also the skills and the embodiments of these robots. It are not all humanoids, for example. So when you integrate robots in teams, they will bring about new human-robot relationships, but also will change the human-human relationships. And that's something that you should also address in your research. They should, of course, match human values and also the, the what you call the social, cognitive, affective and physical processes. The third one is so that uh, human, human and human-animal relationship development that really provides insights and also can provide inspiration for the design of human robot relationships. And for example, so where we work on trust calibration methods, but still there we should really realize that, that uh, human robot relationships is different than a human human or a human animal relationship. It's really something and that we also engineer. So we can learn from human human and human animal relationships, but we should still always realize that it's different. So we need a different kind of models. And here are some uh, of current research that, that uh, we're taking it, so work on trust calibration. So, and that's important that the robot shows transparency, can provide explanations of its behaviors, its reasoning, that you would like to ex uh, share experiences and also work agreements, as mentioned before, as important themes. And maybe now to the last sheet, that's particular for the discussion of today. Um, so, what I think. So, so it's important for the research we do in the Netherlands on this topic is first of all, so that, that we really address diversity. And so and then already what Keith was mentioning, I, I really like it and, and, and that, 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 that folks, and that's the type of research I, I, I think that, that, that we should uh, more intensify and increase. That's more at, at the micro level, but also at the meso and the macro level. Uh, you can think about fair, fairness for specific types of uh, participants or citizens in, in society. The second one is uh, so, so uh, it's important that we plan and conduct transdisciplinary research and development. So not only so by accident or on an ad hoc basis, but, but, but we really have to make that uh, have structural collaborations on that part. And also in the Netherlands, so we already have some very nice examples of, of that. The third one that I think what's important is to do research in the wild uh, and, and they're addressing long term relationship development. So I'm not the only one that who's emphasizing this. It's, it's already long mentioned, but actually in practice, it's not done that often. 
And actually, I think in the Netherlands now, and, 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 and Tiber also knows it very well, so, so, so we have the J network for uh, developing AI technology for people with dementia, and there are field labs, and I think that, 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 that's a nice example about how you can organize that kind of research. And um, so, I, so, so I, I would like to see more of that kind of initiatives. And the fourth one is, is, is what's important, I think, is related research in the Netherlands, also, of course, to international settings. And that provides also insight about, so what's specific in the Netherlands, what is other, so when you, for example, do it in the health domain, you really understand that healthcare processes, the demands and needs are different in the different countries. And that's interesting. And also that, that, that can, can really, importantly drive your research and provide also new interesting theories about uh, diversity and inclusiveness. Uh, that was very short my, my input for today. Thanks, Mark. And then our final panelist is, is Pim Hazelager. Pardon me. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I only have one slide. But I can talk for hours about it, but don't worry, I won't do that. Um, so I'm a philosopher and psychologist by training, but I was always interested in uh, artificial intelligence, uh, neuro computational models, so also neuroscience. And I've always been a philosopher who works at an empirical research institute because I very much like as a student, but also as a researcher now to combine um, theoretical questions with at least possibly empirical answers. So, you know, philosophy sometimes has the right questions, but no answers, just a lot of words. Psychology, AI, it could sometimes be too much experimentation or too much programming too soon. Uh, and they forget about the big questions and it's nice to combine them um, as much as possible. Um, I started out also as a philosopher basically by asking, for instance, what means uh, embodied embedded cognition? What do we really mean? There are many different possible interpretations. So that's the paper that you see below in the small print 2008, a lazy brain. We basically advocated in that paper and some others, a kind of difference in task analysis. If you understand better what the um, physical presence, the, the bodily presence in a structured environment is, you know better which kind of tasks the brain is addressing and which one can be avoided by, by piggybacking or hitchhiking on the environment. Basically, other agents, for instance, are an important embedded structure. So basically, we say the, la the brain is lazy. It doesn't want to go into high mode, deep thought. It wants to run as much as possible on autopilot. And it uses continuously structures in the environment to avoid having to think. And so we need to understand better cognition as this um, interchange between autopilot and deep thought. And this was before the famous book that now everybody has read. Um, that was more theory. Um, in ethics, I got interested because I was working in a brain gain consortium about neurotechnology. And there I learned the importance, also philosophically speaking, of talking to stakeholders, people with lesion studies, for instance, for brain computer interfacing, and to understand what they would like, but also what they would not like, what they might fear. So I learned, and I call this constructive ethics. That in, in order to do appropriate ethical analysis, you need to know what the major concerns are or the major societal stakeholders. And this can sometimes really surprise you. So, so that is something that I very much like to incorporate in this constructive ethics. And the main idea is not to collect the concerns, to say no to the developing technology. I think technology is like a river entering the country. You know, you don't, you don't block it but you canalize it, you move it towards those places where it can do well, and you move it away from those places where it can do harm as much as possible. And the same is with technology and ethics. It's a way of channeling the technology in the right direction. There's a business model there too. If you take appropriate ethics into account, you get better products and you will sell more. So that's the idea of constructive ethics. Uh, so I apply that to uh, societal implications of AI, robotics. I worked on trust, for instance, in human-robot interaction. I did the same with uh, neurotechnology, brain-computer interfacing, brain reading, etc. And um, I wrote on sex robots, 
which was an adventure. Basically, we started out by saying, well, how can we do something useful with virtue ethics? Because most often in AI, you see utilitarian ethics, you know, where you calculate the gains and losses in terms of human happiness. And then um, yeah, calculating is something that AI can do. But virtue ethics is about character development, which is a lot harder to incorporate in AI. Um, uh, could we do something with it? And so we came up with the idea of a virtuous sex robot that would be capable of saying no. And we had this wonderful sentence in the paper, although this may undermine the economic attractiveness of the sex robots, uh, this is not our main concern here. And so we could <laughs> move on to um, the, 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 the philosophically interesting aspects. And so we suggested, for instance, that it might be useful to have such a virtuous sex robot capable of saying no in uh, therapy for people with narcissistic personality disorder under strictly medically regulated conditions. Obviously, don't try it at home. Um, recently, I'm very much interested in the topic of super ethics as an antidote to the too much hyped super intelligence. And the basic idea here is that as a human species, we now have so much self-knowledge in terms of cognitive neuroscience, psychology and neuroscience, that we know our weak spots in reasoning and behaving. And we have the technology to support us. Why aren't we using both AI and cognitive neuroscience to build moral crutches, basically? And for instance, would robots be able to help us, support us in the kind of ethical behavior that we would desire to perform, but out of all kinds of reasons are incapable of performing, if only because we're inconsistent. Um, yeah, so that's basically my um, short interest in uh, embodied agents. Thank you. Thank you very much. So those were all the panelists of today. And now we move on to the three organizers of this event. First, my colleague Zerin Yumak. Thanks, Marge. Uh, yes, so um, I'm an assistant professor at Utrecht University in the Information and Computing Sciences Department and in the Human Centered Computing Group. Um, yeah, referring to the to the other panelists, I also have uh, an engineering and computer science um, uh, background as a, uh, yeah, uh, as a study, but uh, I got also interested in, in both sides on, on the road. So I can define myself interested in algorithmic development, but also perception of uh, social uh, behaviors. Uh, I'm interested in autonomous and interactive social behaviors, both for virtual humans, 3D characters in games in virtual reality, but also physical human-like uh, robots. Um, I have been working on three different type of topics, um, uh, personalization and long-term social interaction, uh, situated interactions in social settings and social animation and nonverbal uh, motion synthesis. So I see a continuous interaction between um, the embodiment of virtual characters and robots, their uh, anthropomorphic properties, affordances, but also perception of people and the, the technical challenges in algorithm uh, design. So it's a very uh, uh, cross-disciplinary uh, area. Uh, just from the field of computer science or engineering algorithms, uh, it covers multiple areas like AI, robotics, graphics, animation, signal processing, effective computing. And um, there are two directions. Uh, earlier it was more rule-based techniques, but uh, lately the focus is on more data-driven approach. How can we uh, develop models um, out of um, um, yeah, captured data, for example, video or motion capture data uh, to model social behaviors. Um, on the evaluation side, it goes to techniques from human computer interaction communities such as IVA, HRI and I, uh, IEEE VR is, for example, involved. And of course, a lot of the theory comes from social science, sciences, humanities, um, arts, physics and biomechanics. So it's, it's, it covers a lot of um, different disciplines depending on what you are developing. And I often joke about it uh, to, to de uh, say do, to develop virtual humans and robots, uh, you need the whole computer science <laughs> department, but also other faculties and other departments, which is, makes it quite interesting, but also challenging uh, topic. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, here in this slide, I want to show uh, some examples of previous work I have been doing and also the current one. 
the first one is personalization and long-term social interaction. That was something I was uh, working on many years back when I was doing my PhD. So the, the research question was, can we develop algorithms that can help people engage with robots and virtual humans in the long term? This is still an active uh, area of research. Uh, a lot of colleagues are still working on that. So uh, my contribution to that was how to model emotions, personality and mem memory to uh, increase the feeling of uh, social presence and task and engagement. In that particular uh, work, I was modeling uh, the robot um, you see in the picture on the right. This is like a realistic human uh, humanoid robot head uh, from Hanson Robotics. Uh, how to model the facial expressions, but how to develop a digital tutor that can naturally interact with users uh, with a distinct personality and uh, emotion and mood modeling and also remembering past exchanges with people um, using also face recognition technology. Um, then later I moved into situated interactions on in social uh, settings. Um, that was uh, when I was doing my postdoc and early years when I was at Utrecht University. Um, so the research question was, can we develop robots that can interact with people not only in two party screen based interactions, but in more populated environments uh, such as airports, schools, etc. Um, so the idea was to how to model uh, autonomous gaze behavior by detecting the interest of the people uh, in, in the in the character, which is called the phenomenon called engagement and also modeling of turn taking in multi party interactions. Um, yeah, a typical setup is, for example, that we were experimenting with is, it, it is at the end, uh, entrance of the computer science building at Utrecht, uh, a virtual receptionist that can naturally interact with uh, people. Um, and more lately, I'm working more on the numerable behavior synthesis part. So it, it goes towards more animation and animation motion synthesis. Uh, uh, in particular, social animations and numerable motion synthesis. So how can we automatically generate numerable behaviors for real time interaction for these embodied characters? Um, the idea here is given a piece of text uh, or audio input or a piece of music. Uh, can we automatically generate the facial expressions, uh, gestures, gaze and uh, posture behavior um, using uh, in particular data driven techniques, um, uh, machine learning and lately more deep learning algorithms. Um, and uh, I, I mostly work with motion capture data where we yeah, uh, do experiments and collect a lot of data where people are interacting uh, in, in uh, two party, three party interactions and uh, um, using this data, whether we can generate uh, numerable behaviors um, uh, in a multimodal, but also um, uh, in, in group uh, settings. Um, I think that is it uh, from my side. Thank you, Zara. Um, yeah, that will be Ruud Hortensius, and I think you can move the slides, right? All right, great, thanks. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Ruud Hortensius, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Social Health and Organizational Psychology at Utrecht. Um, so in my research, mainly um, if I would use three words, I could just say like brains, robots and social cognition. So in my research, I focus on how humans interface with uh, social robots, thereby focusing on um, every aspect of social cognition. So. Um, in one line of research, I try to map the temporal and functional changes in the representation of social cognition, uh, thereby focusing on the distinct aspects of social cognition, for example, empathy and emotion and intention understanding. Um, and I'm really interested in long term uh, interactions with embodied agents. Um, so, for example, if you would be a participant in one of my studies, I would invite you to the lab. And then, uh, in this case, scan your brain uh, in a, during a particular task, and then give you a little robot to take home, and interact for five days, and then uh, look at the the post five day uh, changes in the brain. Um, so I'm really looking at um, real long term embodied interactions. So moving away from screen based or one of interactions with a um, social agent. Uh, that by really focusing on like this complex um, interaction between uh, humans and robots. Um, so as I said, I focus on empathy, um, emotion and intention understanding. 
So really, I was trained as a psychologist and as a neuroscientist, so I was really interested in human-human interaction, and now I use like this, these kind of frameworks to uh, understand human role interaction. Um, that by trying to answer how real worlds uh, shape uh, real interactions with social robots shape everyday uh, social cognition. Um, and in my recent work, I try to move out of these even five day uh, or restricted interaction studies um, and try to use free flow and real world interactions with robots and uh, thereby focusing on collaboration or um, interactions outside of the lab or um, by um, looking at interactions with the robot in a family, for example. Um, so really trying to answer what are the, the psychological forces that drive uh, good and bad collaboration between human, human and robots. Um, and the ultimate goal is, of course, to transfer uh, behavior from a robot to a human, um, so lead to behavioral change, um, and then um, really trying to see if, for example, the emotions of a robot will influence um, the emotions of a human, uh, thereby making a full circle between lab-based experiments and interventions at home to real, real world uh, interactions, all from the perspective of psychology and neuroscience. Um, so that's in short um, my research focus. So I'm happy to give the floor to Marcia. Thank you. Yes. So yes, um, I can also introduce myself. Um, I have a background in communication science and started to do a master focusing on how people uh, interact with technology and how that would influence their behavior or how um, perspectives of the user uh, influence how they interact with technology. And then my PhD research was focusing on social robots and how people interact with this type of technology in particular. And currently I'm yeah, really focusing on this user's perspective still and then uh, researching different responses to robots. And I try to um, separate those responses on an affective behavioral and cognitive component. So the affective component has a lot to do with our uh, emotions uh, and what we are feeling when we are interacting with robots. Then the behavioral component is really looking uh, yeah, at the behavior of people while they are interacting uh, with robots um, and how they would respond to it uh, when uh, surprising interactions are happening, etc. And then on the cognitive uh, component, that is more like the social cognition part uh, as still seen from uh, psychological perspectives. And that is really about uh, our beliefs about the minds of robots that I'm particularly interested in, like what kind of mind descriptions uh, do we assign to robots? Um, yeah, so the three main uh, areas that I focus on in my research uh, is indeed uh, yeah, what kind of minds we ascribe to robots? Uh, do we perceive robots as intentional agents, as moral agents? And what does it mean? And what kind of implications does it have for our society as a whole, maybe even, but also on an individual level, uh, what is happening between one person and a robot? Um, well, very specific situations in which uh, these mind perceptions are triggered is when uh, robots uh, are surprising to us. And that is usually when they violate our expectations or maybe even our social norms. So I'm currently focusing uh, on these norm violations. Uh, what happens when uh, robots uh, put trash in the park of, or when they come sit next to you, even though there's like plenty of space on different benches? So how do we respond to robots when they violate our norms? Are we expecting robots uh, to uphold the same social norms that we also ask other peoples to convert to? And then, of course, you can also uh, turn it around. Uh, do we uh, abuse robots? And when will we do that? Who is it that does doing this? And what kind of behaviors can robots uh, execute to make sure this doesn't happen. 
And then a final uh, part of my research topics is around explainability. So uh, that's also from a psychological focus uh, linked again to the first topic that we perceive robots as inten intentional agents. So if robots are behaving in a surprising way, uh, we expect these robots to explain their behaviors, just that we have the same expectations uh, that other people will explain their behaviors in surprising situations. And yeah, that is also probably the case when a norm is being violated. So if a robot is too loud in a library, uh, it might notice that people are frowning upon its behavior and then it might explain like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was in the library. So that's how explanations fit into this whole topic of many, many research questions that I have. So that will conclude the introduction around of the panelists and uh, the organizers. But we also are very much interested in uh, who are you as the audience? And then I would like to give the floor back uh, to Ruth Hortensius because he has uh, some slides for that. Uh, yes, indeed. So I just posted a link to the Mentimeter um, that if you're a student, you're very familiar with. Um, so let me just share um, my slides. Um, so yeah, as Marcia said, we're very interested in who's in the audience. Um, so if you just can click on the link um, and then answer a few questions on uh, your background. Um, okay, let me move forward to um, the next slide. Um, so first question is, what's your occupation? Right. Love PhD students. Um, and it's good to see that there's um, some interest from the industry as well. That's very interesting. And as you can see, we collapsed some of the, the categories. So. Um, all right, so a lot of PhD students um, and some people from the industry. I'm not sure how many people are actually in the audience. Um, about 24. Right, great. Um, good to see that there are a lot of like early career researchers um, and some people from the industry. All right, let's move forward to the next um, slide. If that's working. Yes. All right, so this is an open ended question. There, so there are, of course, no good or wrong answers. Um, but we would be interested to see what perspective you're bringing to this discussion. Um, so are you an AI student or scholar, psychology, neuroscience, or a combination of both? And it's great to see that there's already a lot of uh, uh, disciplines attending today's panel discussion. Even some people from math. Um, it's a nice broad interdisciplinary um, field. Great, All right, so some people from AI, some people from communication, science, um, bringing a lot of different perspectives, which is very interesting. And some people from psychology. Um, and I think it's always like a question like who's asking what's your background, because I change it all the time. So if a psychologist asks uh, what my background is, I would say neuroscience. If a neuroscientist would uh, ask me my background, I would say I'm a psychologist. Um, Right, um, so I think that were the, um, the first two questions. Um, if there are questions for um, the panel, um, you can put them in the Q&A slide. Um, let me, um, so I will just leave this open 
Um, so during, if you have a question for the panel during the, the panel discussion, you can just type it up either in the chat or um, on the Mentimeter. Um, and then um, we will be able to integrate those questions during the panel discussion. Um, so with that, I would give the floor back to Marge. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so maybe you could stop sharing your slide because I think you can see that still on your computer. OK, so then we can see each other's faces instead of a slide, which is usually nicer. Um, well, this is when the yeah the first official part of the panel starts, which is the discussion part. And the first question I would like to ask, I, I think, to all of you together, is what is actually the role of embodiment in artificial intelligence? Why do we need embodiment, or what kind of effect does embod embodiment add to artificial intelligence? Yes, Pim. Just to try, uh, you know, uh, I think, so I, I've done uh, experiments in virtual reality or I've been involved in experiments in virtual reality with movie clips that you show to participants and then they evaluate something and with, well, more or less real human robot interaction. And I've come to think that these are really three totally different kind of approaches. Um, a real robot, a physical one in your physical presence is so much more real that sometimes I doubt whether, you know, it can be useful for rapid prototyping to use movie clips and then see how people respond to it, especially if you have complicated like ethical scenarios, uh, you know, uh, for experimental philosophy, let's say what I do that can be useful. But if you really want to study human robot interaction, and especially long term, which I very much uh, applaud that you're doing this kind of stuff. That's that's crucial, I think, because there's a lot of gimmick effects in human robot interaction where it's just nice for the first week and then we stop checking, which is terrible. Uh, but then you need real robots. So I think the embodiment is really vital also to see what they cannot do. Eh? You can trick so easily in, in small movie clips. Um, yeah, so it's crucial, I think. Yes, I saw that Mark wanted to respond to that. Yeah, yes, yes, I, 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 I agree with uh, Pim, so, so that, that embodiment is, is uh, crucial eh? because you also, when you would like to have interaction, uh, um, an, an explicit embodiment is required because you, you have to talk with something. Uh, but um, it's interesting also, so, so, it, so what, what we, among other things, did in the Paul project, so we had the physical NAO robot, but we also had an avatar of the NAO. And um, so, so when the children were in the, in the hospital or at a diabetes camp, they played with the robot and when they, they did go home, they just could continue the, the, the same play with also some additional uh, games with the, with the virtual one. And when they just came back in the hospital, they, they again could continue, but then with the real physical robot. And we really did see that there was a kind of transfer, so the experience they had with the physical robot to the virtual one. So, 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 so and, and that, that already nicely shows, yeah, so, so what, what, what I would like to emphasize is that we are really creating a, a, a new type of entity or well, how, how you call it, the agent, and that, that also have really different characteristics uh, like human beings. So, an agent can be everywhere. So when you are connected to internet, it's always there. And 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 and, and that's also that's something that you should be well addressed and, and arranged whether you, you would like it, for example. The so would so like there's to... not a strict boundary between physical and fertile uh, uh, robots. That's, that's what I would like to say here. Yeah, Tibor, you would like to respond? Yes, uh, yeah, I, by the way, I very much agree with this last remark from uh, Mark that there's not always a strict boundary. Uh, yeah, I, I also wanted to respond to the, the comment made by Pim. So Pim made this distinction between uh, showing people videos of robots and the real thing where people interact with robots. I think that's a very important uh, distinction. And also based on some experiments that we did in the past, 
I can confirm that this, yeah, it's really a completely different ball game. Um, if you show people videos, do you give them the um, the, the freedom to um, add a lot of interpretation yourself because you cannot really test the robot. You cannot decide what you say to the robot. So you just have to do it with what you see on the video, which is of course really different from, from the real interaction. Um, but I also wanted to introduce another distinction and that is the distinction between, let's say, physical robots and, uh, well, maybe avatars or even chatbots uh, with which you can only interact via text. Uh, and that may be a very obvious argument, but I think that's also important to, to realize that these are different systems. And that, um, so assuming that we will encounter more and more robots, like Mark also said, we will team with robots, we will collaborate with them. Um, in a social setting, it makes sense to embed these systems with also uh, communication abilities that are multimodal, right? Because um, if you only can communicate with such a system via text, that is, of course, a much more limited way of interaction compared to the whole multimodal. And for instance, the research that Keith is doing, where you really want to pick up all kinds of nonverbal signals is, is I would say, um, yeah, Compare it to the difference between having a WhatsApp conversation with someone and having physical face-to-face -face conversation. That's of course much richer and there are many more cues that you need to pick up. Yes, thank you. Uh, Keith, you had something to add yeah. to the discussion? Yes. So tying to that, um, uh, maybe we need a definition of embodied, but uh, uh, right now how I understand it is like indeed physical versus virtual. So you could have a, a virtual agent or a, a physical embodiment of an agent, like a, a robot. Uh, but I think different situations call for different kinds of uh, agents. And in some cases, situations, maybe, you know, an embodiment is not necessary. Um, but um, I agree that uh, this embodiment, it, this, it does something magic to our brains. Uh, and I guess humans are used to uh, interacting with embodied agents. Humans, we are, I guess we are embodied. Um, but um, yeah, in, in terms of doing research, I think it's, um, yeah, it depends of course on the goal, but Indeed, uh, if you yeah, there's a, a lot of difference between just playing a movie or um, uh, seeing a movie of a robot or interacting with a robot. Interaction is is like a dance. It's adaptive. You you need two of them, two two agents to you know be in interaction. So they are adapting to each other, and you can't do that, of course, if if you're just playing a movie. Yeah, I think uh, we found quite some different results if if we have like comparing uh, between robots on the screen versus uh, physically present robots. Um, sometimes it is suggested that like effects are larger in the embodiment, physical presence, but sometimes we also find complete opposite results. So yeah, it seems like that there are really distinguished uh, situations that might not be easily compared even if you're like presenting the same like pepper robot in a screen versus uh, the physical presence. Uh, Mark, yes? Yes, but maybe also to add to it, yeah, the most of you probably know also the, the movie Her, so when, where there's only the, the, the voice, but I, 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 you could say also that that, that that type of voice is a kind of embodiment, eh? so because eh, so um, and actually, so the, the, there is a kind of representation, of course, that, that we will develop when we talk to that voice. Uh, and uh, actually, so very recently, a PhD student worked on uh, this is on an inner voice. So, so it's so, so, uh, and uh, the, that you have an agent and you, and you, have, you, have, you have earplugs on and, and you hear a, a, a voice talking in. in in yourself, and so so like your inner in inner voice, and then the boundary between uh, the 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 agent and yourself is is, is really very small, you could say, um, um, and 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 then uh, the AI is very close to you, but 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 still, I think there there is some kind of embodiment there, but it's it's a virtual one. 
and it's crucial how, how you design it. So then maybe a follow up question uh, on this of what well, we are discussing embodied in AI from our own perspectives. But can we say something about what is unique in the, the Netherlands uh, of the type of research we are doing based on embodied AI? Uh, and how could we maybe strengthen our visibility like the Netherlands is, is good in this specific either topic angle challenge that we are addressing? I have no answer, but a question back. Um, compared with whom? With what? Internationally is a lot. You know, I, I don't think there's anyone who's able to see how human robot interaction uh, in its various manifestations from virtual to movie to real across the planet is, you know, Japan, China, United States, I, Europe, France. I, I really wouldn't know how even to, to answer that question. But uh, there are better experts in this uh, particular field, maybe than me, that can. But I would be curious. I maybe I, I I can put forward an, another approach. So when you when you say so, uh, think uh, that the social robots uh, will be there in the future. They will be developed, and 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 uh, the Netherlands is now, I think, taking part of the research and development community, and. Uh, in a substantial part, given also the size of the Netherlands. Um, and what you need, eh, because you, you need to address uh, the, the culture, the diversity in it. So you need to, uh, to do your research in the Netherlands with uh, the, 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 the Netherlands population. So when you think about health robotics, uh, you need the patients from the Netherlands. Because the healthcare and the patients are different than in the United States or then in Italy or so so so, so, so and, and to understand these differences you just need it so 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 we we, we need a an, 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 an research community to do that kind of empirical research in the Netherlands and I, I and there are some initiatives but 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 but, but I, I think so, so 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 what we have to do is to emphasize it that, that, that we need to collaborate, collaborate on that aspect in the Netherlands. And, um, and that, that's a kind of other attitude than the one of competition. Uh, and, and, and we all know uh, the, the, the struggle in universities. Uh, so so uh, and, and once that we have to compete for the funding and so on, but, 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 but we need to collaborate to, to have some something to say at, 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 in the, 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 this community. I don't have a solution. Maybe Tibor for a final comment on this topic? Um, yes, so indeed my first response was also that um, it's not necessarily that we have something unique in the Netherlands, but indeed we do have a very strong community. So, and in fact, I'm very happy that some of the uh, representative groups are present here today. So I think events like this one are very useful to bring this community together to strengthen it. And uh, I also uh, am happy to say that uh, so recently the NWO agenda for AI was launched, the AIA NL uh, agenda. And that, uh, let's say, social AI and the interaction between humans and robots is an explicit part of there. So I think we can really exploit that. Yeah, I think this is actually some sort of a nice bridge to a next question that uh, Zeren will be asking. So Zeren, please feel free to take over from here. Yes, uh, Keith had something to say, I guess. Is he... uh, maybe a last comment about the previous question. Um, with respect to the language and speech community, uh, we are working in Dutch, but the whole world is working in English. Uh, and so, um, yeah, trying to collect data in Dutch is, I think, very important. Uh, so indeed, collaboration is uh, yeah, needed uh, in the Netherlands. Yes, so... Yeah, I, I think something relevant to where we left. So uh, it's about collaboration. So what kind of collaborations we are already doing in the Netherlands? Is it like more interdisciplinary collaborations? Uh, what are your current practices? 
And of course, linked with that, we are all researchers and uh, the, the funding schemes are very important, <laughs> of course. So uh, what, what kind of funding schemes are appropriate uh, for this kind of uh, research? Uh, is it more interdisciplinary uh, calls or big ones, small ones? How do you see it yourself, both from the researcher's point of view, like how researchers shape uh, um, the, the, the developments in, in projects, but also the other way around, how, for example, uh, funding agencies like NWO drives this? So how do you see that? Maybe not the easiest question. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, so let me answer the question first for my own perspective and then give you an example of uh, a grant that we recently uh, uh, achieved um, or acquired. Um, so yeah, my own uh, chair is actually, as I said, called Communication Science and AI. So that is already a chair that is by definition interdisciplinary. And in my own research and in my group, I really try to bring these different disciplines together. So the, yeah, the, the algorithmic research, the communication science perspective, the social psychological perspective. Um, and I think, yeah, it's really useful to also as a community um, look for funding possibilities where these different disciplines are involved. And so that's the example I wanted to give. So a year ago, um, we obtained a grant um, from um, an NWO call that was called uh, digitization, digitalization for the social sciences and humanities. So it was by definition also interdisciplinary. Uh, and the project was about long-term conversations with chatbots. So that's not embodied agent, but non-embodied agents. Um, and it involved a consortium where also PIM was involved as uh, the ethicist in the consortium, um, but also three universities. So uh, Radboud University, Tilburg, and the University of Amsterdam. And really try to have these different disciplines there in one project. And I think these are um, yeah, useful ways to to build this community uh, with the different disciplines any other comments on that uh, i was just thinking that an important question both in relation to this question and the previous one maybe combined is so where do we want to position ourselves as a dutch interdisciplinary research community what are the kind of guiding questions that maybe do not stand out yet as an identifiable overall kind of you no know, collaboration team let's say but at the same time, there are current practices. I, I worked on small things with, with Eindhoven and Twente and Delft and TNO and um, I guess another university too that I don't remember at the moment. Um, but but what is the, the so these were all more, let's say, um, incidental kind of collaboration. Something happens and you work together and then it's finished and you move on to something else. Uh, so there's no really, or at least in my case, not a strategic kind of decision or choice. Let's say like, OK, this is a topic that we really can make a difference in the Netherlands or where we have an infrastructure or expertise that really could work well in combination with others. And so let's try to work for this. It's more like what passes by and there's a lot always passing by then. So we could do for a little bit more structured approach to both these questions, the collaboration and and where we stand as the Netherlands, I think. And I think this possibility gives maybe a good opportunity to discuss that also. So it's not just the past, but especially where do we want to go from here, maybe? Yeah. And uh, Mark? Yes, uh, uh, I, I agree. And we could, and in there, so we could also start more from the, what you could say, the European perspective. So that, that really invest also more on, on, on the, the social aspect of AI. Uh, involving the, 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 the ethics and the platforms that, that are there. Um, so so that, that, that would be an interesting starting point. And for example, a theme like inclusiveness and also the, the example that, 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 that Keep provided and, and there, there are so, so, so some more small local initiatives, but, but that, that, that's something that, that, that you could take up. And uh, when you do it together, then um, uh, you can do more and uh, have, have also establish more impact. 
So, so that, that, that could be one theme, for example. Yeah. Just as an example, sorry for speaking again. Um, I have now two students. One is doing research, comparatively speaking, between uh, about chatbot, that is, between Moroccan and Dutch students when it comes to safe sex practices in communication with the chatbot to see whether there's this difference between high context and low context cultures that translates or transposes uh, to, to human chatbot interaction, which could be interesting. It's just a pilot, it's a bachelor project. And another one with a Turkish student that got interrupted but will be picked up, hopefully, is about, for instance, uh, gestures like nodding between Turkish cultures and Dutch. A similar kind of idea, but totally different with the now robots. So these kind of things are there. And another thing about the ethical, so something that interests me very much, like what Maartje and Zedin were discussing, and I guess the root two in a way, is um, if you have long-term interactions, then you get questions as a human, I would think, so this could be a potential societal concern about what does this robot know of me? And maybe in addition, how does it see me? Because when we have long-term interactions, it's not only what you know about me, but also how you interpret me, whether you like me or the character traits that stand out for you that I might or might not recognize. And so something that I think has not been done a lot yet, but I, I didn't check it, eh? so it's just an idea on the spot, would be how do you, in terms of explanations that the robot can provide, ask as a user to the robot how the robot sees yourself? both in terms of the knowledge that's something related to privacy so i think there will be also from the gdpr perspective anyway something like this that as a user you should be able to control and know what the system knows about you what kind of data it collected in the past but also more in psychological terms how does it interpret you how does it see you as an agent as a person so these could be topics that i think might be interesting for future research or collaborations Yes, Ruth has something to add. Well, so there are uh, two questions that are related for two questions from the audience that are really related to this. Um, and I think also to the previous point that was made on Dutch or like Dutch language and AI. So uh, so one of the question is, um, so how do we keep embodied AI and um, um, research on voice available in all languages, not just English at the European level, right? So this really speaks to the Dutch um, infrastructure um, and the second question so that's the first question and I will put the, the second question here as well so how do we like integrate um, the, the the point that Pim was making about ethics on like long-term interaction most of these AI technologies are from US uh, companies right so how do we integrate the privacy aspect in during these like long-term interactions but maybe first the the first Dutch language uh, question. Um, I was trying to unmute myself, but there was a, a thing in front of it because someone typed in a message. Um, yes, and actually the Dutch language. Um, so if we're studying emotions for example and that's also relates to the comment from um, uh, the audience someone uh, from in the audience we also need um, uh, you know data from the dutch culture so how do dutch people express themselves in the dutch language um, and um, yeah there are some initiatives about um, you know collecting all the data in a repository you know there are there's the ldc for example or elda so there are ways to uh, publish your data uh, openly but it's it's quite difficult um, not everyone shares their data of course uh, partly due to privacy issues um, but yeah, there are some initiatives to make it publicly available. Um, and uh, yeah, there are other minority languages and they're also struggling to um, uh, put themselves in the spotlights. Um, yeah, I don't really have a good answer or solution to that, uh, other than that we should emphasize that there is more than just English or the Western culture or uh, 
Um, yeah. Uh, maybe I, I can add to, to the, 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 that one. So, so the, the, there are also some, uh, what you could say, norms, yeah, politeness, for example, in your conversation. And uh, the, 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 it's also culture dependent. And uh, the, the, that's also an, an inter interesting topic related to this. So, 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 you had, so you would like, so that in the Netherlands, but that's so, so the, the kind of how we communicate, that the, the, um, uh, is, is also being expressed by, by, by the agents. And, and, and when they learn it, they do it in, in they learn to speak in a Dutch way. And related to it, we should also realize this, so, so, so that there are also a lot of low literates. So, and, and actually, we have rather a, an active community in the Netherlands uh, paying attention to low literates and looking for educational purposes. And how, how also how to design uh, the conversation that also low literates really, really can understand. It. And that's something I think also so, so that, 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 that we can better show to the outward world so that the, the type of knowledge that we have in the Netherlands on that aspect. And that can be really beneficial also for the design of human robot or human agent communication. Yeah. And actually within the Netherlands, there is an initiative. Uh, so uh, we have a stichting called the Stichting Open Spraak Technologie which strives for making open source models and making uh, speech data uh, available. Uh, and it's really focused on Dutch. Um, and we are, you know, the people of the board are also connected internationally. So that that's, would be one of the goals of the, of the Stichting to also make ourselves known at the international level. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, a follow-up question related with this um, Dutch landscape and, and funding, etc. is of course uh, also the connections to industry. So I'm also curious about your, your experiences on that. Uh, so how can virtual agents and robots become part of society beyond research and what is the connection between universities and industry? And to what extent do our research aims align with companies, what they're actually working on? And which in which domains, for example, education, health, etc. Yes, Tibor. Um, yes, so I think in principle, virtual agents can be applied to many domains, but actually the, the, the ones that I always see coming back are the ones that you just mentioned, Cesarin, which is indeed healthcare and education. Um, and I think in many lists, they are always on top when it comes to uh, AI potential. Um, yeah, so of course, virtual agents, they can be potentially deployed in situations where they take over some of the hard work or the repetitive work of humans. and. Uh, as we all say these days, of course, they're not meant to replace people, but they're meant to, as an um, addition, to really take over those, uh, for instance, conversations that are really, can easily be done by computers. Um, and then, yes, in healthcare, you see um, um, a lot of potential uh, because, of course, there's already uh, understaffing to a very large extent. So um, you may think about situations of intake conversations in hospitals or uh, yeah, types of interactions that are, uh, are pretty standard. Um, and another domain that you see a lot is education uh, or training. Actually, that's something that I uh, did a lot of projects in. So using embodied virtual agents, for instance, for training of social skills. Uh, so some of you may know some of the projects I contributed to in the past. And that was always also in collaboration with industry, uh, for instance, to develop uh, simulation based uh, training games, you could say, for, for example, for people in public transport. So for the bus drivers and train conductors, allowing them to practice certain conversations, like how do you deal with aggressive clients, for instance. Um, and then again, this is something that I think is a, is a market for um, because the, yeah, this, this really offers possibilities to scale up existing uh, training systems, right? So when it comes to training for public transport, for instance, this is traditionally done using role play. So uh, they bring people in a room together with actors, but these actors, they need to be hired and that costs a lot of time and money. 
So uh, yeah, simulation based training could be an outcome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but of course, these are just uh, two examples. But um, I think, at least from my perspective, there is uh, growing interest just really from industry to 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 use uh, embodied agents for these applications. Yeah, and indeed, I also see quite some interest in the, in the recent years, also with the development of technology. But uh, do you, do you see some sort of gap between the motivations of or or how the how the industry is functioning and what the researchers are aiming for, and do they? Um, come together easily or do, do, do you find it challenging as well or more complementary and more motivating? Um, um, I guess both, but uh, it's, it's yes. not <laughs> uh, Definitely. So uh, again, from my own perspective, for instance, this, this project where we try to develop training system for the public transport. Um, yes, as a researcher, you really try to do this systematically um, based on theory, um, with a valid validation at the final stages of such a project. And typically the, the time scale, I think, is a bit different, right? So from industry, of course, there's an incentive to produce these systems much quicker um, compared to uh, the average academic project. But maybe the others have similar experiences here. Yeah, Pim. I would like to ask a question in relation to the industry, do we have an idea about what would be a realistically feasible kind of killer app for robotics? Because if you think back about, you know, with the, the, the early 80s without a computer and then the Commodore 64 appeared and 10 years later everyone had a computer, what was the kind of stuff that you could do with the Commodore 64, this very, with the cassette, you know, it was a terrible machine in a way, looking back, but then it was great. But what did people discover there that actually computer games were a lot of fun because they were really different than basically any other kind of game that you could play outside of it. And that was a sort of killer app, you know, really something that drove the industry and started the whole PC at home kind of revolution. I, it, it's a history. Yeah? I'm not claiming that this is the history, but, but I don't see exactly if I think about human robot interaction that would really have a similar kind of effect like in 10 years the industry has been transformed and everyone has one at home i can either think of things that are not realistic to my knowledge but you know better like a a, a butler robot you know or i think much more about very functional designs non-humanoid you know simple tool kind of robots that do simple things like the roomba but if it's really about human robot interaction, then what would be the sort of thing that ignites the whole development? I don't I don't see actually currently in which direction even to look. And without that, I think also talking about industry interest is still a little bit difficult because it's too undirected. Maybe I'm wrong, eh? but it's just my, my, my feeling about this. So where is the killer app, people? Quick, let's become millionaires soon. Sorry, no, it was a joke. Huh? It was a joke. Yeah, but perhaps you are, you are right, Pim. There's not really a killer app, but it's more like probably once the technology is developed enough to be somehow deployed uh, in, in homes, in, in, in the street, we will start to see many of them. Yeah, like, but, uh, but the thing about, about the Commodore 64 was that it wasn't developed enough. It was terrible with the cassette, you know, um, but it was uh, 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 payable, affordable. It was 600 guilders or something in those days, like the price of a TV or a, a refrigerator. And what you could do with it was, you know, new enough and interesting enough to start the development. So you cannot wait till the technology is developed enough. You have to find something that is new enough and working reasonable enough and affordable enough. That's that's the three criteria, I think. And, and I don't see. So in that sense, maybe we're a bit premature if we don't have something like this in really thinking about well structured collaboration with industry. I and mean, that will be incidental, too, for something that they find interesting in the particular field. But it's not going to be a um, um, taking off kind of moment yet. But again, I might be might be wrong here. Yeah, Mark has a comment. Yes, I, I, I think that's the wrong question, a killer app. So uh, as a, uh, because 
agents, robots, that they are so diverse. And actually, so, 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 and, and the industry is really growing. Yeah, so, so, so when you see the figures uh, the, the, on, on the robotics, it's really increasing in all different domains. So another domain that was not mentioned by Tibor is, for example, the search and rescue domain. Of course, there the robots look different eh? and you have drones and you have uh, ground vehicles, but still there, there there's communication and, and agency and, and the kind of uh, embodiment of AI that we're talking about. Uh, so so, so it's, it's quite diverse. And actually, so I, I just I'm just reading an, an interesting book. Eh? So the new breed of uh, uh, Kate Darling, and that compares eh, so, 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 uh, the, how we look at uh, robots and the development robots with uh, human-animal relationships. And, um, and, uh, it, it, and, and you say, so you, you, you uh, the, the, the mustn't always compare it to human beings, but, but to learn what we learn from, from animals. So we have dogs that support us uh, and all, with all kinds of tasks. Yeah, also for urban search and rescue, for example, but also for diabetes care and all kind of care, they have a specific role. And, and yeah, you wouldn't like ask for what is the killer of a dog, for example. So, so, so you are developing something completely new in different domains and they can really get a completely different kind of manifestation for that support. Okay, it's, it sounds like it's a, it's a uh, long long discussion, but we have many more interesting questions in line and we are a little bit uh, running out of time, so I want to pass the ball to Ruth, so he will have more questions, I think. All right, thank you. Um, so as we saw, there are a lot of PhD students uh, um, in this uh, attending this panel discussion. So my next question is really about like training the next generation of researchers uh, in this field. So how could we best prepare these um, students to tackle all these like big issues and questions and like um, like good uh, university industry um, uh, collaboration. So any insights on that and how can we actually use, for example, like these collaborations um, in the training of these students? Uh, I can start with a somewhat biased uh, view. So uh, as I mentioned, so I, I, I work at uh, the university and at TNO. And uh, TNO is more eh, on uh, applied scientific research and with uh, close connections to industry. And we run a lot of projects with close collaboration with the stakeholders. And I use these projects also in my education. So the, I, I really see it as a kind of win-win situation it so 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 you really can study and show how to study human robot collaboration in the field with the concerning stakeholders and um so so that, 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 that that's an example and, and uh, also i have a close collaboration with the care center in uh, the delft region peter van forest and there's, uh, they uh, also have a kind of lab, and there the students are also in that lab with the robot. And there's a care uh, uh, organization for people with dementia. So, so, so there you are really closely connected and, and can investigate also the, the effects of the support in this type of context. But others also will have some experience, of course. Yeah, I think especially uh, in our field, uh, yeah, you cannot start uh, in, as 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 uh, Mark or Tibor just liking computer science or just liking uh, psychology. It I think it has to be a combination of both. Uh, so really, the multidisciplinarity you really need to like both. Um, and um, yeah, I think that 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 is important. Uh, but that's that's also hard for students, right? Because they're like these projects take longer. Um, you need to uh, consider different perspectives, so it's really hard to do it in a master uh, thesis, for example. But Tim, you have some insights on this. No, it's just that I I think the combination makes perfect sense. So it's interdisciplinary, but it's also in the field of application, like with the people with dementia. Because in the lab, 
you can think of lots of things that are theoretically interesting and challenging and that can be really great research and eh? there's nothing wrong with it but is if you want to involve for instance industry it has to work out there on the place where and there's only one way to find out what works and what doesn't work and that's to work there with the people that are going to use it so the end user domain has to be part of the educational process i don't know in which way whether you take two months or three months or so working with the industry too so we we are starting it's a slightly different topic um with the societal impact track for two years in the ai master in uh, nijmegen in uh, september not next year but the year after and we hope to achieve that in the last year there will be intern at a societal stakeholder to discuss the ethics as they, the stakeholders perceive it, not as it is written in the handbooks by philosophers, which is great, but it's not always practical. And I feel that maybe we should think about doing this for students too, whether that's master students or PhDs you can discuss, but you have to be in the field somewhere, these field lab ideas that are floating around uh, everywhere, and you have to be three months there to understand what the people need. Like in caregiving institutions, what do the caregivers want? What do the care receivers want? And what do they not want? And and uh, we, we see this happening, but again, not structurally as part of the educational program. It's just the choice that you make sometimes for your internship or something. So that would be a recommendation, I think. Yeah, so if I can add, I fully agree with that. And in addition, I would like to really plead for a more cyclic process. So I think too often we are tempted to first develop something and then deploy it in a more linear way. Uh, and of course, we really need to learn from experience from end users. We need to learn from lab studies and then go back to the design phase and yeah, to try to incorporate these findings. So more like co-evolution between the two processes. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, Right, so like I think this is the, the big final question um, before we go to the informal uh, discussion, but this is the biggest question. So um, from your point of view, what is the, the main challenges that embodied AI is um, like facing now and should be working on first? So like a killer app, as Pim has suggested, but are there other like main challenges that we should be um, focusing on? Pim. Uh, first of all, I want to say that killer app is a very unfortunate word of choice in context of robots. So we should find another phrase, but I hope you understand what I don't mean. Um, and the second thing is um, things like safety and the ethical concerns about what the system knows about you, the possibility that you get manipulated, you know, from influencing to nudging to uh, manipulation is a small step for AI. Um, uh, these kind of concerns need to be addressed. Uh, that's the constructive ethics part. If you have a product, I guess, that will not be able to incorporate that in a well, you know, architecturally grounded kind of way, you don't have a product for social robots, eh, for human robot interaction. Um, and so there, I think there's a lot to be done and to be gained. Um, so that would be my my basic suggestion here, yeah. All right, uh, Tibor, anything to add to that or like a uh, totally um, different perspective? Yes, so I agree with many things that have been proposed already, but I wanted to introduce two additional ones. Uh, one is uh, theory of mind of robots so developing social agent that truly understand what people want and reason about their desires and goal and emotions um i think that's still to a large extent missing uh, and the second thing i want to say is more standardization in uh, measurements of for instance questionnaires to measure when do we perceive a robot as human like or as believable there's many things are being developed but i think we need standards there with my two cents. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Yeah, um, Mark. Yeah, I, I, I also agree, and I, I would like to to add to it. So, so what, and, and actually, this is an important topic now. Also, of, um, our research is what we call human um, AI co-learning. So, so, so 
that, 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 that you ha really have a, a collaboration between the learning between the, the AI agent and the human agent in a specific task setting. And uh, for example, what you need then is, is you have to ha need a memory to build on and then and, and to reflect on also the, the task performances. And uh, that, that, that are important challenges now, yeah. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Keith, any final challenges that we didn't address? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that's what you meant with co-learning, Mark, but um, yeah, the, the fact that a robot can learn from the human over time and learn its uh, uh, personal preferences or um, other things. Uh, and the other point is, I think, uh, what's mentioned before, the long-term interaction. Um, I think we need more research and more studies in um, you know, just putting a robot in someone's home uh, for longer than an hour. <laughs> but that also uh, asks for uh, a robot that works. and. Uh, a lot of the times the robots are not autonomous yet. Uh, it's either wizarded or something else. So I think that's a, that's a big challenge. Yeah, I think like the autonomous social robots are still like out there. Um, and like once there is autonomy, um, that might change the, the, the study of human robot interaction a lot um, because then it's scalable, um, I think. All right. Um, well, I think this concludes the, the formal um, part of the, the panel discussion, right? Uh, Marty, I'm looking at you. Yeah. Um, so now we can open up the floor to some questions of the audience. Um, so maybe there are some already some questions in the chat. If not, I will have a look at the Mentimeter just now. Um, but like one of the questions that wasn't answered really is how to um, look at the um, like privacy aspect from the point of view that a lot of these um, robots are built by big companies, big US based companies. Um, so any views on that, it's like the privacy issue? Uh, just a small comment before that from organizational point of view. I'm going to stop recording now, so we'll pass to a more informal drinks <laughs> conversation uh, style. So yeah, thanks everybody. <laughs>